My father told me a story once. I'll never forget it for a few reasons. I think it's the first story he ever told me as a child. It's also the story of how my grandfather died. But honestly, that isn't the reason. You hear stories on TV or sometimes you hear over something in a public place. People talk about ghosts and aliens and you think to yourself, that isn't real. They're making it up or they're mistaken or they're crazy or something like that. You just can't believe it. Until something happens. Something that brings it all together, connects the dots in a way that you don't think of before. Maybe it happens to you. Maybe you hear the same story again and again, happening to different people. It doesn't take long for the world to become a lot bigger than you thought it was. As I said, this is a story my father told me, but I never believed it, even though he swore up and down it was true. It wasn't until I started clicking around the internet I started to believe. I started to hear other stories, just like the one my father told me. It didn't take me long to believe in the rake. That's not what my father called it. Of course, he's never used the internet in real life, uh, so he wouldn't know what the consensus was taken in naming it. When he chose to call it something other than it or that thing, he called it Skinwalker, after an old Cherokee tale his grandfather told him. But I'll tell you the story the way he told it to me. We were out hunting one night, he'd tell me. Coyotes. We'd kill them for 50 bucks for skin. They lived on a dairy farm in Ohio. They'd kill calves sometimes. We'd do it every night because we needed the money. Sometimes while we were out, we'd come on a deer and kill it. Our landlord didn't mind. He could feed our family for a few nights and save us some money. Anyway, we were done making our rounds and heading home, walking, because we didn't have a car or some four-wheeler back then. We cut through the woods. That's when we came up to it. Blood. Everywhere. Splattered on the trees and the grass and the creek. Everywhere. At first, we figured it was a pack of coyotes. We'd seen it sometimes. They can't scavenge and start hunting deer cattle. Worse was when they bred with feral dogs. This wasn't like that. See, when a pack of dogs or wolves or coyotes attack something, they do it right. They'll pick off one that's weak or sick or old or just small. They'll hunt it, draw it into a corner someplace it can't get out of, and they'll run it right to the biggest one, the alpha. And that deer will never see that alpha. It might hear it, but it won't see it. It'll just notice that its throat is gone, and then it'll drop dead. It's quick, it's clean. That wasn't what happened here. Something had run up on the den of deer. Coyotes won't just attack a den. Wolves neither. But they get too much of a fight. There were three, I think, three bodies, just torn apart. You'd see a head here, a leg there, a torso there. Predators don't do that. They don't leave behind scraps. What done this hadn't done it for food. He had done it for fun. But we didn't know that. We saw a bunch of carcasses, and we think it's something we got to take care of. I remember my dad telling me to go home. He thought it was a pack of feral dogs. But I wasn't leaving him, and I damn sure wasn't walking through two miles of woods alone with nothing but a twenty-two and a pocket knife. He was only thirteen at the time, so a twenty-two rifle was about the only gun he could reliably use. Dad had the shotgun, and I wasn't going anywhere without it. It took me a while to convince him, but finally he began tracking whatever did that. It wasn't hard, either. We just followed the blood. Either that thing bled a deer before it got away, or it dragged one for a mile. I don't know. I know that I'd never seen my dad scared before that night. He started hearing noises. I've been a lot in woods in my life. Been all over the world and I ain't never heard noises like I heard that night. I heard things screaming. Heard deer and fox and rabbits and raccoons and birds just scared. Keep in mind, it was maybe twelve or one o'clock. Except the fox and some birds. Nothing was supposed to even be awake. They weren't just awake, they were moving. I saw flocks of birds that night fly straight into the trees trying to get out of there. We came up on a pack of coyotes, nearly shot a couple, thinking it was the, the, them that was looking for us. But then we saw what they were running towards. They ran right past us, didn't even notice. Then some deer did the same. Then some rabbits, squirrels, foxes, even a couple wild hogs. These things were supposed to be eating each other. The only thing they cared about was getting out of there. We should have put it together. Maybe whatever they were tracking, it wasn't something we were supposed to see. It wasn't something we could kill. I don't know why we didn't just go home. I guess we were curious. Stupid, maybe. I think that was my dad's nature, to go towards trouble, to fight. And knowing what I knew about what my father did during the war, my nature was to stay close to him. We finally did get into an open alley. It was a normal soy field, but it wasn't in season, so it was just flat dirt. We saw the tracks then. A lot of the animals playing the forest had paved over the land. 
where that deer blood was, nothing had taken a single step. They were waiting, for, leaving it, leaving it for us to find. The tracks were shallow. Whatever it was couldn't have weighed more than a hundred pounds. That didn't mean much. A bobcat weighing forty pounds wet nearly tore out my damn throat once. All that means is that it's quick and hard to kill. So we followed the tracks, and it doesn't take long to find where it is. There's this old schoolhouse that sits on the top of the hill. Half of it had been ripped out by a tornado. But nobody lived there, not for a long time. We caught homeless people in there sometimes, or druggies looking for a safe place to shoot up. Figured maybe that was it. Maybe it was some sick kid riding a high. But we didn't think that for long. We get within 50 yards and we hear this noise. A screeching kind of sound. It was sort of made up of two different sounds. One was a high-pitched screech. Another was a low-pitched growl. It was making both at the same time. We get within 20 yards and we hear this sound. I can remember thinking that it sounded like paper being torn apart while someone was swinging water in a bucket back and forth. Dad looks at me, kneels down, and whispers, I gotta stay behind him. We're about to corner him. Any animal will fight when it's cornered, especially when it's a predator. We can tell by the tracks that it's just one. He tells me it's probably a single feral dog, probably rabid. The plan is to sneak up on it while it's eating, shoot it, and keep shooting it till it don't move no more. Then slit its throat. If it gets to Dad, it's my job to shoot it or stab it to get it off of him. So he walks up and I'm right behind him, just tied to his side so I can see what it is. I wish to this day I hadn't. I was leaning over a carcass. Tears off its flesh and throws what it doesn't nibble aside. There's blood all over the brick, glistening in the moonlight. It's pale white, human looking. Not quite human. It had arms and legs like a human, but it sat like a monkey hunched over. Its hands weren't normal. It had long fingers with claws at the end. So we see that, and my dad hesitates. He wasn't about to fire on a person. So he clears his throat to try to get it to turn around. I swear to God, all the noise just ceased. I ain't never even heard true silence before that, not after that. But for two seconds, nothing, nothing made any noise. It made it all the louder when it turned around. It made this shrill cry and jumped on Dad. He got a shot off. I think he missed. If he had hit the thing, I didn't mind. But it was on him. It tears parts of him off. I started shooting at it with the twenty two point blank, but it barely bled the thing. I got off five rounds, and then I started hitting it with the gun butt. But it wasn't budging. It didn't even register that it, it, I was there. It clawed at my dad, taking off bits of his flesh. It started on his torso, ripping off the skin, his tit. <laughs> then it moved up. It tore off his throat. It tore off his nose, his eyes. It scalped him. And it started digging in and ripped off the bottom half of its jaw. Little bones in that tube in your neck, called an esophagus, then his ribs. I don't remember exactly what happened, but somehow my dad's knife ends up in this thing's shoulder, and my dad ends up on his back. On my back. I'm running. By God, I'm running faster than I've ever run before or after, and it's following me. I end up back in the woods, opposite the ones we've been in. I'm heading toward my landlord's house, but it's half a mile away. I can hear this thing screeching and moaning. I hear the tree branches crack and get thrown around. It sounds like someone's taking an axe to every single tree I pass. It's cracking so loud and so often, but I just ain't looking back. Finally, I trip into gravel. I look up, and there's my landlord and a bunch of his buddies drinking around a campfire. I scream and I cry, and they come over. I'm telling them to call an ambulance, and he looks at me, and I'll never forget what he said. What is that on your back? He asked me. Just as he said it, he saw one of those god-awful flannel shirts my dad wore everywhere. It was all that was left to dad. Most of his head, his torso, but nothing after the waist. Suddenly he hear it, screeching. He grabs me, my dad gets thrown on the ground. I'm fighting him, crying, because I think we can still save him somehow. My dad had been gone before I ever picked him up. He has to pick me up and throw me inside before I come with him. He and his buddies were all inside and then locking doors and getting guns. The landlord's asking me, What happened? What happened? But I just don't know what to tell him. He pieced enough of it all together and understand there was something dangerous there. All the lights in the house were on and someone called the cops. We'd be there in about 15 minutes. We look outside and I see it walking for the fire they'd made. Don't know what it is. One of them says it looks like an ape man. Suddenly something goes through the window. 
We'd shoot at it, but that ain't the thing. It was my landlord's dog. Just the body, though. Not the head or legs. We start pushing things in front of the doors and windows when we hear something in the garage. I remember one of his friends saying that the doors were open. We hear metal and glass get just get ripped apart. We put a couch and a TV in front of the door to the garage. It banged around some more, but then it got quiet. Not silent, like it was before. We could hear it move around some. The guys were talking, making sure the guns were ready. Someone hands me a pistol. No sooner did I cock the hammer back and we hear something shatter upstairs. Then we heard it screech again, so now it was louder, and it didn't echo and fade out. Because it was inside the building. We all rushed to the one door leading upstairs. When we got to it, just as that thing did, it opened it just a bit, and four or five men just slammed into it. Slammed into it. He got his hand through. Someone with a shotgun took care of that. Put the barrel right up to his wrist and pulled the trigger. Cut its hand off clean. That only pissed it off, though. It started pushing on that door, crawl clawing. We were on his side, pushing as best we could. And it was on the other, doing the same. That wood just wasn't going to hold. Someone tells us to keep our heads down. Suddenly, the top half of the door is just gone. My ears are ringing and there are splinters everywhere. Two or three of them just unloaded right on top of that door. I don't even know where it went after that. The police got there. I was still glued to that door what was left of it. The sun was up before they got off, got me off of it. They put me in the hospital for a while. A lot of people talked to me, but I didn't talk back, not for a long, long time. When I got home, I got a job, job from the landlord, working on the farm. We didn't talk much, not about the thing, but I signed up for the army when I was 19. He sat down to drink some scotch as a send-off. I asked him right away what the police told him. The story they went with was a wild animal, probably a wolf or a bear that had migrated north. <laughs> I asked them how they could say that when they had the hand. He looks at me stunned. He tells me that the hand never made it back to the station. The cop who had it in his car wrecked, drove into a tree, died on impact. The hand was never found, probably taken away by an animal. The cops, when they would acknowledge that the hand existed at all, said it was simply the paw of a bear that looked like a human hand. I never talked to that landlord again. He went missing when I was in basic training. The cops never found him. Said he owed some people some money and he just ran away. But I don't think it's that simple. I never went back to those woods. I wouldn't even if I had the whole goddamn U.S. Army at my back. But that was a lie. When my mother died, I don't think my father felt he had anything left. And then he might as well settle old scores. He went to those woods. He never came back. The FBI was called. They did a show for everyone involved. But I knew they weren't really looking. I had to get one drunk and slip him a few fifties before he finally told me that they get a few calls about those woods every year, about someone up and vanishing. But that was all he wanted to tell me. Before he got up and left with the rest of his team, he wrote, The Rake, onto a napkin. I didn't know what it meant until I searched for it on the internet. Honestly, I would rather have not have known.